And here we are in chapter 2b. Uh, just a few extra slides so that I didn't go over too much time in uh, part 2. We're going to uh, continue talking about um, action potentials and the ramifications of how action potentials are formed and how they work to, to create complex or a more complex language across cells. Last time, just uh, before we wrapped up, we were talking about this complex figure, which is showing several graphs simultaneously. It's showing you the status of the, of the voltage-gated sodium channel, so the status of the potassium channel. It's showing you the permeability of sodium and potassium and the voltage and the excitability and refractory periods, absolute and relative. Uh, you know, it's a busy graph. Uh, but these graphs become more common uh, when you get closer and closer to healthcare. So uh, I think it's an important skill to be able to use a graph like this. So you can almost count on uh, having to use a graph like this uh, during the next uh, assessment. Just take it one piece at a time. Ask yourself, what do these things mean? And there's hardly anything in this graph that doesn't have a purpose of some kind. So let's just go over it one more time when it comes to action potentials and don't skip by this slide and here's why. So we're going to have that graded potential enters the trigger zone and the graded potential may originate from some part of the cell or it may originate from a previous patch of axonal membrane. Voltage gated sodium channels open and sodium enters the axon causing a depolarization event. That positive charge spreads along adjacent uh, sections. That's, that's the phenomenon known as local current flow. That's what's causing a graded potential to, to depolarize the next section of membrane. So this is the, the event that's being spoken of here. There's a graded potential, local current flow. Local current flow causes the new section of the membrane to depolarize. So we're just restating what's already happened here. It's just now it's happening in the next discrete section of axon. Then we, you know, we depolarize, uh, you know, do the positive reinforcement cycle of sodium, and then the inactivation gates close. And by then the, the potassium gates are open. We're repolarizing the membrane. That absolute and relative refractory period, especially the absolute refractory period, prevents that local current flow because it's spreading in both directions. Okay, It's not just spreading downstream, it's spreading in all directions, just like that droplet that we saw in graded potentials. So we are with that refractory period, especially the absolute refractory period, is going to prevent us from sending an axonal potential upstream. Well, that's the last thing we want, right? We want to send things unidirectionally. The sensory neurons bring it into the uh, central nervous system. The effector neurons are sending it out and neither change direction. And so the refractory period is a very, very important mechanism for preventing that backward conduction. If you isolate a, a, what's called a squid axon, very large axon, it's easy to manipulate in a, in a lab, you can let it sit in a, in a, in a, a solution bath and it'll have zero uh, you know, propensity one way or another. You can send, you can send a, a signal downstream, relatively speaking, anatomically, or if you let it sit for a while, you can send it upstream. That's because there's also a second mechanism involved, and that's what we call basal tone. Here's the graphical representation of that from your book. If we have a depolarizing stimulus, local current flow physics dictate that you're going to see positives move towards negatives. And as the cell is regenerating upstream, it's, it has uh, a, you know, a normal minus whatever uh, membrane potential. So we don't want this to fire off and start sending signal that way. We want to send it as, you know, presumed this way in, in, an, in a single direction. And so this patch of membrane will still be in refractory period, probably relative refractory period, but nevertheless it is less likely or not likely at all to be able to fire off.
let's put this all together now using the anatomy of a neuronal cell. And here we are at the uh, axon hillock initial segment. Graded potential in this case, because it's coming from some other part other than the axon, causes a depolarization event. And uh, we will hit threshold. When we hit threshold, we get that rising phase followed by a falling phase. So if you look here, you see the two pluses, that's kind of in this part right here. And I guess I could put a little shape there. In either case, what's happened is this, this part rises and then it falls. And so it's back to a hyperpolarized state at this point. Meanwhile, this one is still you know, relatively depolarized. So as sodium comes in, it will wanna to move towards that negative charge. It will wanna to move towards that negative charge. In this region, it is refractory. So all of this area is either in absolute or relative refractory period. That means that even though there is some local current flow coming back on it, only this side is capable of firing off a depolarizing uh, action potential. That's the, that's the sequential nature of it. It's moving, so rise and fall here, rise and fall here, rise and fall here. It's just that immediate region behind that rise and fall area is going to be still an absolute refractory period. And the further, it almost looks like it's getting a little bluer here to me. Uh, this is more in the relative refractory period. So if this area fires off again, it may be able to fire off another action potential there. Uh, this has already been mentioned, but I want to reinforce it. The idea that action potentials, while relatively faster than graded potentials, uh, also vary in their overall velocity. That is to get from point A to point B uh, in a neuron. And um, one of those uh, aspects is uh, diameter. And it has to do with a, uh, a biophysical uh, phenomenon that as the radius increases, the membrane appears more and more flat and that can affect uh, kinetics of transmission. So larger axons are faster uh, in their action potentials. Um, myelinated axons are also faster, and that's what we mean by resistance. Um, a myelinated axon has very little um, side, uh, ion leakage, so you don't have the weakening of a, of a, of a local current flow slash graded potential. It's, those are almost equivalent. Uh, the local current flow doesn't weaken in the way that it would across a standard plasma membrane. And so uh, what you get is um, a combination of um, very, very robust current flow between uh, shooting between uh, nodes, uh, what we call nodes of Ranvier, and this collectively is called saltatory conduction. That is to say, it appears like it jumps from patch to patch, and that's due to the fact that local current flow can move very, very quickly in these hyper-insulated segments. You have very, very little uh, intrinsic resistance in those areas, so you can have near instantaneous uh, shift in, um, in polarity across these uh, individual nodes of Ron VA. And so here's just a picture. This is a very, very large axon with immensely fast uh, velocities, and here are some smaller smaller axons that are, uh, that are unmyelinated. This one here is almost a millimeter across, which is just gigantic in cellular terms. And here's a little more detail about how saltatory conduction works. You have the same protein and channel setup in these nodes of Ranvier that you have on other unmyelinated areas like in the axon hillock. So when you get this depolarizing stimulus, you're going to get that action potential phenomenon that uh, we've described with sodium and potassium and the reset and all of that fun stuff. But as sodium flows in, that local current flow ensues. And again, with this myelination here, you get a very, very robust local current. And you even get to the point, you even get a kind of a secondary external shift in flow. Um, but uh, the main point is that because of that, uh, because of that insulation, you can get very, very rapid transmission of the change in voltage from one segment to the next, saltatory conduction.
So the strength of depolarization is enough to trigger depolarization of the next node, even though it's relatively distant. And it has to do with that internal flow of ions, but also this sort of external uh, uh, counter flow occurring on the outside of the uh, myelinated segment. The problem arises when we have issues where the myelin is disrupted. Uh, this can be due to autoimmune disorders, de spontaneous demyelinating diseases like uh, ALS, um, uh, uh, and so uh, myasthenia gravis and some other things. In any case, when we lose that insulation, what we get is inappropriate current leak. So now we're getting uh, loss of, 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 the, uh, of, the, of the concentration gradients across the membrane that are essential for that voltage phenomenon. And what can happen is the, the signal weakens before you can uh, effectively initiate action potentials at the next node. And so the, the symptomology is, um, is, is quite clear. You get tingling, numbness, muscle weakness in some cases, loss of coordinated movement. Those are all relatively common uh, symptoms associated with uh, demyelinating disorders. And I, and I thought it was interesting that um, with our ATP uh, case study, uh, that, uh, that that sort of mimicked that, and that's why it was misdiagnosed, because demyelinating disorders are much, 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 much more common than an ATP metabolic disorder. That's a pretty rare thing, because ATP is so essential that if you can't make it correctly, that's usually a pretty lethal situation early on. Um, he clearly had enough metabolic capacity, the patient in that, in that case study had enough metabolic capacity to, to function up until a point, and then I think the demand of his body mass basically just took over. But nevertheless, in here, if we lose, or in some cases we can get inappropriate uh, depolarization occurring. So we may trigger off an axon midstream which can lead to inappropriate perceptions, inappropriate uh, 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 stimulations of, of muscles and glands. By extension from that previous slide, I would like to spend the last couple of slides talking about situations where ion imbalance or departure from physiologic standard values can lead to inappropriate or abnormal neurologic or neuromuscular function. So we're going to start with a normal situation, and then we're also going to talk about uh, potassium, which is abbreviated K for calcium. That's the old Latin term, Latin name for cal calcium. Emia, meaning in the blood. So if we have normal kalemia, we have a normal blood value of somewhere around this. And so if we have a subthreshold stimulus encountering that neuron that's, uh, that's in this normal kalemic situation, yes, we get a depolarizing and then a repolarizing. This is a graded potential here. Restored due to the efforts of sodium potassium ATPase. All right, so subthreshold. And again, with a normal kalemic situation, a supra threshold stimulus, we reach threshold, we fire off an action potential at the axon hillock, right? Again, we fire it off when it reaches threshold. So if we don't reach threshold, we don't, we do, we do. In hyperkalemia, so we have too much potassium, what happens is the resting membrane potential shifts from a minus 70 towards maybe a minus 60 or a minus 65 or somewhere in there. Depends on how out of bounds you are in terms of the value. Remember what I said that when you move the membrane potential to a more positive, that you are excitatory, well, that's what's happening in hyperkalemia. You are creating an excitatory situation, and now what would normally be a sub-threshold displacement is now closer to threshold, and you fire off a, a, an action potential, even though under normal circumstances you should not. That would mean an inappropriate perception that would normally not be perceived, or an inappropriate command where a command was not issued. So how does that happen? And why would the resting membrane potential be pushed 
more positively in a hyperkalemic situation. Well, you could say, well, it's self-evident. You've just got more positives around, but it's not that simple. Okay, I would love to love to just defer that way, but that's not actually the truth. So we have our sodium potassium ATPase here, right? It's using ATP to pump those ions in their respective directions. Generally not sensitive to concentrations. Okay. It, eh, you know, eh, maybe, you know, in really extreme circumstances it might be. But remember what else is going on in this situation. If this is high, then the quote unquote desire for potassium to leave because of diffusion. Remember that these are leak channels. We are letting sodium leak back in down its concentration gradient. We are letting potassium leak down its concentration gradient. If this is high, this concentration gradient here is weakened. Okay, It doesn't take a huge amount of potassium to do that, just enough to perturb the, the flow. We have more potassium staying inside the cell because it's not diffusing out. We're getting closer to equilibrium here. So the rate of diffusion is slower and more positive inside the cell makes it more positive. Okay makes it more positive. So it's depolarizing. That increase in potassium depolarizes the cell. It pushes it towards the threshold. It is an excitatory phenomenon. Let's look at the opposite scenario. In hypokalemia, what we see is that resting membrane potential shifts to a hyperpolarized state. And what would normally be a threshold stimulus, let's put this at minus 70, it would easily reach threshold and fire off, is now a sub-threshold uh, situation. So something that would normally be sent to the central nervous system or, uh, or elicited from the central nervous system to a, a peripheral tissue is no longer being done. And again, let's look at the, the cellular side of this. Again, we're pumping sodium and potassium. Now, maybe there's an affinity issue here. If you don't have enough potassium out here, maybe you can overcome affinity. I haven't seen any data to indicate that, though. Uh, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I just haven't seen that data. On the other hand, though, we have a channel here. And that channel is not as subject to saturation as, say, a carrier. This is a channel. And so if we have a stronger gradient between the inside and outside, it stands to reason that more potassium will flow out at a quicker rate. This, again, is not as subject to, um, to saturation that a carrier might be. It is facilitating diffusion, but it is not, in fact, changing conformation or anything in this situation. And so potassium flows out. We have less potassium in here, which means that this becomes more negative. It pushes us this way. It is an inhibitory phenomenon because now what would normally have fired off doesn't. And we can play that game for sodium. We can play that game for chloride, and we can even play that game for calcium to a certain degree. Using potassium because it's the most profound in that situation. In fact, if we were to go to um, uh, if we were to go to the previous slide, high dose potassium was, and uh, if uh, I haven't checked lately, is still used in, um, in certain types of lethal injections. You use high dose potassium uh, during, the, uh, during, the, during the phase of causing cardiac arrest um, to, uh, to anesthetize the patient. They, they, put them, they, they render them unconscious first and then they administer the lethal cocktail. And then part of that lethal, lethal cocktail is a high dose potassium. And so this concludes this, uh, this segment for part two. We're going to move on to part three of chapter eight. Um, hopefully I can get it done in one, if I can get it done in 30 minutes or so. If not, I'll uh, probably break it up into a couple of pieces, again, for, for ease of consumption, if you will. I know it's tough work. Um, it's it's uh, not ideal, but uh, hopefully uh, we make it as... Um, uh, we facilitate uh, the process as well as we can. And thanks for your time, and I'll talk to you soon.